Welcome to Author Talk on CBSNews.com. Uh, I'm Jeff Glor, joined today by Nathaniel Philbrick, uh, author of Why Read Moby Dick. Um, let's start with that basic question. Not that it has a basic answer, but why read Moby Dick? Well, you know, it's, I think it's a novel that's gotten a bad rap. And, uh, because it's so long. It's so long, it's digressive. It's too many people were assigned it in high school, hated it, and never come back to it. I think you, gotta, you should come back to this novel late in life because it contains all sorts of information that becomes relevant once you've lived some, had some life experience. And it's, it's timeless, really, in, in what it has to teach us. Um, it, it, we, we, we talk about its density as well, and you, and, and you talk about its poetry. You say there, you know, there, there, there are passages, there, or just one line or two lines that you spend five or ten minutes with. Yeah, it's it's as much a book of poetry as it is a, a novel in prose, and the sheer level of the language is magnificent. It's it's sort of like, you know, Bob Dylan for a couple of years in his twenties was putting out stuff that is, you know, just incredible. Uh, Melville at 31, yeah. when he wrote this, was just in a zone, and uh, the poetry contained in that is, is just magnificent. Let's talk about Melville at that age, because he had two kids, two young kids. He was struggling financially. This was a big deal to try to go off and write this. He didn't know it was the great American novel at the time, um, but he wasn't in the the best of situations. No, I mean, he, he had probably what is uh, a, a biggest curse a writer can have is have your first book be a big seller and then all the other ones gradually getting less and less popular. And he was getting older, he was, had all sorts of family obligations, and he decides to move from New York to the Berkshires in western Massachusetts. And uh, he and he decides he's going to write a, a novel about whaling, which doesn't uh, hit you as something that's going to you know bring in the bucks and so he had a lot writing on this and what's interesting is he didn't do the safe thing by any means uh, with all these pressures mounting on him he really set out into the unknown and he did it um, you say forget about trying to figure out what the whale signifies yeah. why well you know I think so many of us are hit over you know movie Moby Dick, the white whale, is a symbol of yeah. something. It's this for this person, it's this right. for another person. And the fact of the matter is, Melville creates an incredible beast <laughs> with Moby Dick. I mean, this is a whale that should be seen as a real whale. I mean, it's not, it's, sure it has resonance that goes beyond any living thing, but I think it's, it's, you miss something if you don't read it as a true adventure story about which there's all this other stuff happening. Okay, so don't put special significance on the whale, but what about some of the characters Ahab? Certainly, he's been compared to many folks yeah. over the years. I think you, you mentioned Hitler. Yeah. Um, today, maybe an oil baron, maybe an Arab dictator. Those fair comparisons? Yeah, they are. I mean, why this novel works uh, 150 years after it was written is that he creates a portrait that is much more than time bound. It, it just resonates in a way. And so if you know you see Omar Gaddafi as Ahab, I, I don't think that's a, a misreading of the novel. It's what Melville does. He's, he's tapped into something that makes you feel what it's like to be alive in any age. And, and you recognize types from that novel in your own experience. Timeless. Timeless, it really is. And, and the irony is, we can go to it and see all sorts of things, but when it came out in 1851, it had a very small readership. It was a, a, a financial and critical disaster for Melville. And it still had a small readership even when he died. What it was when, when Oh yeah, when a fraction, his first novel, Typee, sold four times as much. And Moby Dick, the, the novel we all go back to, uh, sold just a fraction of that. 3, just over 3,000 copies, copies by the time he was dead. Four right, years right. Later. And it probably sells more than that than a week these days. And, and, but, you know, the novel had to get beyond its own time, I think, for people to, to read it in its proper context, which is, you know, seeing Ahab removed from just the context of whaling. It's so much more. For those who are intimidated by it, by by its length, by the by the what can be the density of the writing, is it is it is it, is it fair to pick and choose and just pick up passages? Absolutely, I that's how I read it. I, I mean, I every now and then I will read Moby Dick entirely through, but for me, it's like the Bible. I sort of pick it up, and often will just read whatever I turn to, and inevitably, I'll just find myself lost in that paragraph because it's it's 
poetry. It's also really interesting what he's doing in terms of just the history of his own time. And I, so I really recommend it. For example, when I wrote this book, I was reading Moby Dick when I was on book tour. So I was on planes. And Moby Dick is full of short chapters that seem to have nothing to do with anything else. But it's perfect for, you know, we're always looking for, Absolutely. You, know, you know, quick ins and outs. And Moby Dick actually works quite well for because that. Because it is so digressive. Yeah. Um, you, you said Melville was a man condemned to landlessness. There was no refuge from the storm for him. Yeah. Um, what, what was the, the writing of Moby Dick, a, a minor refuge in that landless life? It was definitely an exhilarating experience for him, uh, in large part because he had bonded with his new literary idol, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Right. And, uh, his muse. His muse. And not, Hawthorne's, a, you know, obviously influenced the book in a literary fashion, but it was almost a personal relationship that Melville had. And he, he, went, he wrote this novel in sort of this, you know, he was really hepped up. And you can see in the letters he wrote to Hawthorne during this. And, um, and so he was feeling it. Uh, but, you know, what you see is after it, this great drop off of, of enthusiasm, you know, just sort of here he's put his whole life into this book and it goes nowhere. And talking about what he put into it, I mean, there, there were times when his family was, was concerned about it, right. very well, concerned about it. Yeah, he would go upstairs, you know, they had just moved into the country. He would go upstairs to his upstairs uh, study, which the house is still, is now a museum. And he'd start writing about 9.30, and they'd knock on the door after about 2 to give him lunch. Usually he didn't respond. And it was, you know, four. He was locked in. Yeah, and he'd come out and he'd just, you know, he'd be in a, called a mesmeric state. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did this day after day until the point where his eyes really began to bother him. It was like they had been scalded in his skull. And, and so it got to the point where he had to close his eyes while he was writing. He was just pushing himself that hard. You said he, th th then he dealt with a 40-year backwash yeah. from, from writing Moby Dick. Did he, did he come out of that backwash? Well, you know, I, not really. He continued to write, and he continued to write very well. The short stories and, and stuff he did after that uh, in poetry are, are very important. And he would die with um, Billy Budd, you know, that classic, on his shelf. But he, he was a very depressed man. In fact, his family got very concerned about him. His marriage was not great and insisted at one point in the uh, late 1850s that he go on a trip to Europe in the Holy Land and where he saw Hawthorne uh, for one more time and had a very uh, emotional uh, reunion with him where Hawthorne says, you know, this is, he talks about a man uh, who's, who may not know what he believes but is always questing and that was Melville. Mm. He was always searching and never content uh, in his belief or his disbelief. Don Quixote? Don Quixote with an edge, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he never truly found, or at least he, 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 he wouldn't know he did because it, it didn't have, get the critical reception that he wanted, Moby Dick at least. Um, would he be surprised today if he knew? What yeah, I, well, you know, I would, I would think, who knows? I think, uh, I don't, you'd have to be surprised, I'd guess. Yeah. But, um, it, you know, this is a novel that was rediscovered after World War I. But do you and, think he knew he, he made, in his yeah. mind, that he made something great? Yes, yes. You can tell by the letters to Hawthorne. You know, there, he, he knows he did something really amazing. And Hawthorne knew he had done something amazing. And he says at one point in a letter, not that you recognize what this book was about is all I need to know. And, and so I, he, he knew he had hit it out of the park on one level. But, you know, we all are human beings living in a world where... Uh, peer group uh, is, a, is a part of it, and it, it, it made for a, a very difficult uh, life afterwards. Authors still fighting to compete with, with Melville today? Ernest Hemingway. He, he was very proud that he had read uh, Moby Dick as a teenager in Chicago, and uh, in his 50s, in a letter to his editor, he said that Melville was one of, the, one or, one of one or two authors he was still trying to beat. Nathaniel Philbrook, author of Why Read? Uh, Moby Dick. Uh, this is a much shorter book and, and, right. <laughs> and, and worth checking out. So check out his book and then maybe return to uh, Moby Dick as well. Uh, you've been watching Author Talk on CBSNews.com.